NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. I am the person that you guys are usually trying to discredit on the stand. I get it, right? Um, I'm a medical examiner and forensic pathologist. My job has actually changed since this slide. In the last three days, I am now transitioning to the state chief medical examiner's office with the Department of Health in Tennessee. I'm also still working as an assistant medical examiner at Knox County, which is in the eastern part of Tennessee. So. Mm -hmm. Didn't have time to update my slides, but uh, that's who I am nonetheless. I don't have a filter, and I have a habit of saying really horrible things in front of large groups of people, so I'm going to apologize in advance. And because of that, my employer has made me put this disclosure. It says the horrible things I say are mine and mine only, not theirs. And so now I also need to add that it's also not the views of the Tennessee Department of Health as well. So if you have a complaint about what I say, tell me you're Bonnie. Don't, don't call my employers. Um, or you can, I guess, if you want to. So we're going to really take a deep dive into how do medical examiners and forensic pathologists decide what is a drug death and what's not. We're going to get down into the weeds, get down to the nuts and bolts of it. But here are the four main topics we're going to talk about today. What the components of a drug death investigation should be. I do a lot of lecturing to law enforcement. I do a lot of lecturing to state prosecutors. A U.S. attorneys, and I'm pleased to say this is the very first time I've ever been invited to speak to a group of public defenders. I hope it's not the last, but I'm glad to do it. For your own clarification, the information I present is the exactly the same no matter who I'm talking to. So you guys are getting the same lecture that the, quote, other side gets, if you will. We're going to talk about cause of death. There's been a lot of talk today about cause of death. What does cause of death mean? We speak different languages. The medical cause of death is not the same thing as a legal cause of death, so we have to figure out a way to understand what each other are saying. We're going to talk about post-mortem toxicology. Dr. Drake did a great job of telling us about a different type of the drug testing, but we're going to talk about post-mortem toxicology, the blood and body fluids that come out of the dead people. Different thing, uh, can be fairly complicated. And with that, we're going to talk about something called post-mortem redistribution. By a show of hands, how many of you have heard the term post-mortem redistribution? I would hope it would be all of you, but by the time you leave today, you'll know what it is. PMR, for short. Know your expert. Know who you're talking to, because I do cases in consultation for both sides. I see, just like Dr. Drake said, there are lots of people who misstate their qualifications, and there are a lot of people who are giving testimony about things they have no business testifying about. It's frightening. For me, as a forensic pathologist, I'm horrified by some of the things I hear other, quote, experts say. For disclosures, we're going to be looking at autopsy photos and death scene photographs. If that's a problem for you, it might be time to get up and go take a nice walk around campus on this beautiful day. But it's hard to talk about death investigation without looking at dead people and their photographs. Um, so that being said, I've noticed a lot of people taking pictures with their cell phones. Please do not take pictures of the death scenes or the autopsy photographs with your cell phones. Even though the, the cases have been redacted, um, just for privacy of the decedents and their families, please do not take photos of those. There are clickers on the table. We're going to have fun. You guys are going to help me with some sample cases. There's about 50 floating around, so 50 of you will have to volunteer. So when we get to those slides, uh, you can, you'll know when to click and when to not. And there's also on the table, there's a fact pattern that um, is actually based on a true appellate case from the, was it the Sixth Circuit? Do you remember, Douglas? Iowa. Yeah, we can't remember. But anyway, it's an appellate case. We'll get you the information. And that's for the mock, uh, that's for the mock cross after I'm done. So. Again, I come from a part of the country in Tennessee where these drug death prosecutions are, are they're pretty, uh, pretty common, and they're becoming more common. I've done it both for the prosecution and defense for state level and federal level cases. So I've kind of been involved, and I see what other medical examiners and forensic pathologists are doing around the country. And this is uh, General Sharm Allen. She is the general 
uh, Attorney General, District Attorney General where I live in Tennessee, and her office has been very active in prosecuting uh, drug-related deaths. I want to have questions as we go, if you don't mind, instead of holding them till the end. So if you have a question, something's not making sense, just raise your hand, yell out, and we'll try to answer it as we go. I know that Pennsylvania is not a medical examiner state, it's a coroner state, but just so you know kind of what my background is and what my practice is, this is Tennessee. Tennessee is a medical examiner state. To be a medical examiner in each county has a medical examiner, you have to be a physician, but not necessarily a forensic pathologist. So each county medical examiner acts as a gatekeeper and they decide if the case goes for autopsy or not. If an autopsy is done, it goes to one of those five regional forensic centers that are marked with the red tags. We're very proud in Tennessee. We are the only state that has a state law that says if you do a medical exam or autopsy in Tennessee, it has to be done in an office that is accredited by the National Association of Medical Examiners. Has anybody here heard of the National Association of Medical Examiners? If you haven't, you need to know about it because that's the professional organization that sets the standards for accreditation of the offices and for how we do our jobs. And in your packet, there is a position paper from the National Association of Medical Examiners that tells you and tells investigators how these drug death investigations should be done. So name, I'll be using that for short, but we're very proud of that. If, so we're a step ahead of the curve. We still have a way to go, but we're a step ahead of the curve. Is a drug overdose a murder? The short answer is, it depends. It depends on your investigative perspective. It depends on what the goals of the investigation are. And it also, of course, depends on the legal norms of the jurisdiction. Now, what I have found with uh, drug overdose cases, it also depends on who's working it, right? So you might have drug detectives or drug cops, right, the vice guys, working the death. So you've got drug drug cops working homicides, or you might have homicide detective working drug cases. And there are things that are specific to each type of case that doesn't really make each one particularly well suited for the other. So keep that in mind as to what investigative perspective the police or other investigators are coming from. All death investigation is local. There are no overarching federal standards about what a death investigation should look like. Someone already has mentioned today, at least more than once, the difference between a coroner and a medical examiner or a coroner and a forensic pathologist, and we'll talk more about that as we go along. Okay, what is the best definition of cause of death? A, the circumstances in which someone has died. B, injury or illness leading to death. C, a list of all diseases and injuries present at the time of death, or D, None of the above. So what is the definition? We've all been talking about cause of death. What in the world does cause of death mean? What's the best definition? All right, we've got some work to do. <laughs> What's the right answer? The right answer is B. Cause of death, the definition of cause of death is an injury or illness that sets in emotion a chain of events that leads to death. That's, me that's, that's medical examiner speak for when you ask me what's the cause of death, that's what I'm going to tell you, the injury or illness that sets in emotion a chain of events that leads to death. It's that simple. It can get kind of complicated, but that's what cause of death is. All right. Cause of death is usually pretty easy to determine. Sometimes it's not so easy. SIDS means we don't know. SIDS means there's been a complete autopsy and investigation and additional studies, and we don't know why the child is dead. So technically, SIDS is not a diagnosis. A lot of people say SIDS, but it's not SIDS. What else do we need to know to determine the cause of death on this child? Everything. everything. What does everything mean? You are right. Need scene investigation. We need medical history. We need an autopsy. We need toxicology. But one picture. This is why I like to talk to cops about how an investigation can completely change the complexity of a cause of death with this one picture. So the cause of death is an injury or illness that sets an emotion a chain of events that leads to death. That's, that, again, that's the medical examiner speak, which might be different than your legal speak. The but-for cause of death is the legal standard. And again, you guys all know about the but-for cause of death, but that's not the way we talk. Doctors don't talk about the but-for cause of death. I don't even really know what that means. I know what the legal interpretation is. 
You've already heard about the Burrage standard. Significantly contributed to is another example, but it's different. Now that's not manner of death. The manner of death is different still. The manner of death refers to the circumstances in which someone has died. And in most states in the U.S., you've got five choices. Natural, accident, homicide, suicide, and undetermined. These are the medical classifications of death. They are not the same thing as the legal classification of death. Our professional organization and the National Association of Medical Examiners, or NAME, says that drug overdose deaths without evidence of intent to kill yourself should be classified as what? Accident. So there's a, there's a, a guideline that unless you have pretty strong evidence that someone tried to kill themselves, these should be classified as accident. How many of you have seen local coroners calling these cases homicides? Yep. That's advocacy. That's not an objective medical opinion or an objective death investigation opinion. That's advocacy, okay? This is an actual death certificate. How many of you have seen cardiac arrest listed on a death certificate? Is cardiac arrest a cause of death? No. What does cardiac arrest mean? Means your heart has stopped. How many people do you know that are dead that their heart hasn't stopped? Zero, and his ho I've got about five years left till I retire, and I hope it stays zero for another five years until I'm gone. Cardiac arrest is not a cause of death. It is so hard to teach doctors not to put cardiac arrest on the death certificate. It is a meaningless thing. Same thing for cardiopulmonary arrest, right? Same thing, means your heart and lungs stopped. Same deal, the outcome. So this person says that death is the cause of death, right? How many of you have seen this? Acute combined drug toxicity. Is this good enough? No. It needs to say specifically, again, the national recommendations say you need to list specifically which drugs were the acute combined drug toxicity. So what I do is I say acute combined drug toxicity or acute combined drug overdose, parentheses, heroin, fentanyl, methamphetamine, alprazolam, whatever the case may be. Polypharmacy is another word that means the same thing. A lot of drugs. It's not good enough to just say polypharmacy or acute combined drug overdose. Not good enough. All right. You've heard me say it a couple of times already. The legal language is different than the medical language. We have to figure out how to understand each other. The legal definition can be complicated. There are terms like contribution, acceleration, substantial, Again, I'm not exactly sure from the medical perspective what that means. And I've already mentioned that drug overdoses without intent of self-harm as classified as accident. So that in a whirlwind is cause of death. Any questions about that before I go on? No. Sure. Yeah, one here. Question. Yeah, so the, the question is what are the national recommendations? So there is a position paper that should have been in your uh, material, if not, it is the position paper on investigation of opioid deaths by the National Association of Medical Examiners. It's available online. If you go to the name, T H E N A M E dot org, the position paper is about to age out if it hasn't already, but they're in the process of doing a new and updated position paper. Those are the guidelines that I'm referring to from the National Association of Medical Examiners. Yes. Right, so the question is, where do you get that information to tell people that's advocacy, calling something a homicide as opposed to an accident? It's in this position paper that I'm referring to, and it says just what I just, you know, just what I just mentioned. It says in the position paper that drug overdoses without intent of self-harm should be classified as an accident. And you can use that paper to show whoever you're doing your cross-examination of on stand and say, uh, you know, Dr. So-and-so or Coroner whoever, Coroner Smith, isn't it true or are you aware that there's a recommendation that these cases should be called an accident? Put it right on them, right there. Um, so again, if that, that, that paper should be in your, um, in your materials. If not, we can get them to you. So that's obviously not going on in some jurisdictions here um, in Pennsylvania. Um, so, you know, you, your, your medical examiner, your coroner, should be an objective, independent, 
opinion about cause of death. So even though I am typically called to the stand by the prosecution, I am not a prosecution witness. I am an objective, independent medical um, opinion, and the coroner should be that as well. Just because they're elected doesn't mean that they should be able to take a side one way or the other. There is also, in addition to name, there's also the International Association of Coroners and Medical Examiners, IACME. So medical examiner's offices are accredited by name. It's voluntary. But if you're a coroner's office, there is a voluntary um, accreditation by the IACME. So if you, you know, if you're not a medical examiner's office, there's still a reason, there's still uh, a way that they can be accredited. All right, I'm gonna skip this because you've covered it already this morning. You guys know about the Burrage case, so I'm gonna, just gonna skip that. Another quiz. The most important factor in determining cause of death in a drug-related death is A, toxicology results, B, scene investigation, C, autopsy findings, D, medical history, or E, all of the above. A few more people, play along. I think there should be 50 responses. So the answer is what? The answer is E, all of the above. So the standard says you can't just take toxicology results alone. You've probably seen it in your casework where somebody goes out, sticks a needle in the body, pulls it out, sends the blood off for toxicology and gets an answer and calls it an overdose. That's not good enough. Our national recommendations say that you have to take all of those things into consideration when determining cause of death. Okay, I've already given you the answer to this. There are standardized recommendations for drug investigations. At this point, somebody just out of pure obstinance will pick no. <laughs> See, there you go. Three people saying no. Uh, yes, there are national uh, standardized recommendations for drug death investigations, and we're going to talk about those. True is the answer. I like to keep things simple, right? I like to have a recipe. I like for people to tell me what I need to do my job and do it correctly. In this case, the perfect martini is pour gin, vermouth, and olives in the trash where they belong, and number two, drink whiskey. It's not quite that simple for death investigation, but it's pretty close. So here are the two standards that I was talking about. So the first one refers to the standards for the scene investigation. Right here, it's available online, published by the National, the NIJ, the National Institutes of Justice, and it's how medical death investigators are supposed to investigate the scene. The second part, the recommendations for the investigation, diagnosis, and certification of opioid-related deaths by thename.org, those are the standards that I'm talking about. The scene standards, we call it every scene, every time. All right, and those are the standards that should be used in the medical examiner or coroner's office. Here's what those standards say. An autopsy is only one factor in the determination for cause of death. It also goes on to say that an autopsy is best practice. Do you guys know the difference between an autopsy and an external examination? An autopsy is where you actually cut open the body, look at all the organs, and look to see what's wrong with the organs. An external examination is just where we look at the outside of the body and potentially draw toxicology. The standards say if you think somebody died of a drug overdose, you need to do an autopsy. Now, I will tell you in reality that's a pretty damn hard standard to meet. We have limits on the number of autopsies per doctor that we can do. And even in our own office where name are credited, we can't meet that standard. There are some exceptions to that, uh, but Again, the recommendations are if you think somebody died of an overdose, do an autopsy. You have to have other information that includes scene, inv scene information, medical history. You need to know among part of their medical history. Again, this is something that was talked about early. What is their tolerance level? We'll talk about that. Do they have a drug use history? This is where the prescription monitoring databases or the prescription monitoring programs come in. Do you guys know what I'm talking about with the PMP? If not, you should. The PMP are what the states mandate that prescribers check when they're filling um, uh, prescriptions for controlled substances. So that helps us determine someone's drug use history or their medical history. And of course, toxicology and other laboratory studies, okay? 
Scene investigation is very important. There's a lot of cases, again, where I see no pictures of the dead body, no description of how they were found, but this is what a scene investigation should look like. It's extremely important to document um, the, where the body is in relation to its surroundings. The scene investigation can help you establish where the drug came from. It can help you establish how it was being used. And um, it also helps us interpret any findings we see on the body. You want to document, the investigators want to document what the outside of the residence looks like, where the decedent was found, what's around them, exactly how they were found. So how does this help us with root of use? How is this person using his heroin or fentanyl? He's smoking it. Glass pipe, smoking it. He unwraps it from the lottery ticket, puts it in the foil, heats it, and smokes it. That tells me how he's using it. Yes, question. But that tells you how he may have been using it at that particular time. As far as information regarding tolerance, I don't know how you're getting that history from just looking at a snapshot like this. And all of the information that you're receiving is coming from law enforcement, it sounds like, which from a defense perspective, that calls me to question the independence of your opinion because it's all filtered by the police. Sure. Not all the information we get is from police. We have independent investigators that go out and take their own pictures, right? Because we have what's called medical death investigators. Some jurisdictions don't have that. But we don't just rely on this. We also rely on medical records. So we, we have subpoena power. We have administrative subpoena power. We get our own medical records. We pull our own copy of the prescription monitoring database. That's a great question. It's a fair question that I get asked a lot. Dr. Hawes, aren't you relying on information that you were given by law enforcement? The answer is yes, but I have to get that information from somewhere. Could it be biased? Yes, um, but that's not all the information we get. Good question. The question is, um, are our independent investigators best practice? The answer is yes, yes. And we'll talk more about the certification that they should have later on. You guys are asking great questions. So this is just part of the story. There, there's more to the story, right? This just gives me an idea of how he's using it because that can affect the interpretation of the postmortem toxicology. How is this person using it? Snorting it, right? And some of these can be pretty subtle. So when I'm giving this lecture to law enforcement, I mean, for, for a, a novice investigator, this might be missed, right? This is AARP card, great, right? I love irony. This is, all, all, this is great. When you, re, when you request the entire medical examiner case file, that's a clue, right? Don't just get the autopsy report and the toxicology report. Request the entire medical examiner case file. These things should be in there. Um, true or false or something else, a medication inventory of opiate drugs is a necessary component of a death scene investigation. True, false, true but only if an overdose is suspected or D, True, but only illicit drugs should be inventoried. You guys got, are getting this right on the head. Yes. A medication inventory of at least opiate drugs should be part of a complete death scene investigation. So the correct answer is A, true. Again, this is what the same photograph should look like. Take pictures of the pill bottles. Count the pills, do an inventory of what's in there. This, when you're asking about tolerance, this is where we get our information from, what's on the pill bottles. This is where we start. This is how we know who to subpoena for medical records. It's not enough just to take a picture of the outside of the bottle. The investigator should look inside the bottle because just because it says Xanax on the outside does not mean it's Xanax on the inside. Take a picture of the inside. What's wrong with this? What is suspicious about this? No label. Again, a strong indicator that this person is not using their medication as prescribed. What about this one? Mixed pills. So yeah, no label. Mixed pills, another clue. Although I do have some mixed pills in my backpack right now, so <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. So the inventory should include a comparison of how many pills remain versus how many were dispensed, the administration reg regimen, who prescribed them, where, when, and to whom was it filled, and make sure the pills in the bottle match your pills prescribed. 
course, this is more important when you're dealing with like an um, oxymorphone or oxycodone with a, a prescriber case. Um, but it's just good practice to get into. So things you look for that are suspicious for drug misuse. Multiple medications, labels off of them, multiple prescriptions for different people, altered transdermal patches, which refers to fentanyl, needles, baggies, crushed tablets, and injection sites on the body. Big clue here that this person probably has a substance use disorder or opiate use disorder because you've got what right here? Suboxone. Suboxone is a mixture of buprenorphine and naloxone. I don't have time to get into why it's mixed like that. It's used to help uh, prevent them from using it in ways in which it wasn't prescribed with some moderate success. Um, but again, that's a clue that someone has an opiate use disorder. Anybody know what this is? Uh, close. It's a fentanyl package, but as far as evidentiary value of what can be seen, it's marked with a tag. Any car fans out there? Bugatti, right? Really fancy car. And in our part of the world, people are really proud of the fentanyl that they're producing and they label it. But from an investigative perspective, it's good because it's kind of like putting a trademark on it. Yep, so there was an empty one of these at the scene. Again, things that might be missed at the scene if the death investigation is not complete. What's this person doing? Crushing. This is a pill crusher and a cut straw, so they're crushing it and snorting it. His wife, he, he, this, the person that died had a prescription for oxycodone, and his wife tried to tell me his doctor said it was okay that he could crush it and snort it because he couldn't swallow pills. Yeah, that's what I said too. Uh, methamphetamine is making a huge comeback, especially in our part of the state, and the thing you have to realize about methamphetamine is this is not the methamphetamine that's being cooked up in a bathtub anymore. Where is this methamphetamine coming from? Mexico. So they import the precursor chemicals and they're making high-grade methamphetamine in laboratories in Mexico. So this is not the kind of methamphetamine that you see cooked up in a trailer in a bathtub somewhere. This person is what? Smoking theirs. Again, just evidence of drug use that should be documented at the scene. This was a really interesting case there in Knox County where, um, where I'm living and sometimes working. But what we're starting to see now um, with some of the heroin, some of the stronger heroin, some of the other fentanyls, is people are dying either with the needle still right beside them or their needle is still in their arm, right? But what was unusual about this gentleman was one of the investigators noted this. It looks like a little piece of mouse poop in a paper. Anybody here know what this is? This is black tar heroin. How much black tar heroin do you think we see in Tennessee? That, this much. This mouse turd much, right? So somebody automatically knew at the scene immediately there was something different about this case. This was not your typical heroin bought off the street. So they looked around. There's a close-up of it. They looked around, and guess what? It turned into a mail case, turned into a federal mail case because he was having shipped to him from California. Okay? Again, the investigation should start at the scene from the very beginning. Okay, another quiz. The most important piece of evidence from drug, actually, sorry, it's not a quiz. Most important piece of evidence from drug death scenes is what? Cell phone. Used to be that cell phones would go back to the family as personal property. No more, no more. They are immediately confiscated by police. This is where the information that's convicting your clients is coming from the cell phone. So this is just a little clip of what they saw at the cell, at, uh, from the cell phone. Uh, and observed that on the afternoon of his death, he was engaged in a series of text messages with a subject listed as blank ordering fire, which the affiant recognizes through his experience and training to be a mixture of heroin and fentanyl. The drugs at the scene were not collected or tested. No autopsy was done. Well, you know, why would you want an autopsy? There's a needle there. There's drugs there that look like heroin. A limited toxicology panel was done. The cause of death was called acute heroin toxicity. And the heroin dealer, through text messages, was, was indicted for homicide. And it appeared to be sole source. So it looked like she was only getting her heroin for one person. True or false? The investigation appears to meet recommended standards. False. Right? I've already given you the answer to this already. This does not meet recommended standards for several reasons. So the answer to that is false. Okay, 
Accurate determination, just like I said, has to include scene information. So we've just kind of covered the types of things that should be collected at the scene. Medical history, which will include things like tolerance, drug use history, and toxicology or other lab st studies. What is the most common physical finding in drug deaths? A, nothing. This is a trick question. A, nothing. B, needle puncture marks on skin. C, cirrhosis or hardening of the liver. D, enlarged heart. Or E, frothy fluid in the nose or mouth. This is a trick question. So what are the two answers that you think are probably partial credit? A is nothing. E, frothy fluid in the nose and mouth. So we've already seen that. So the frothy fluid in the nose or mouth is very common in people who die of opiate overdose. So Dr. Drake told you, how do, how do people die of opiates? Opiates suppress your breathing, and so your breathing slows down, and your breathing slows down, and your breathing slows down, and then your heart slows down, and your heart slows down, and then your heart stops. And because of that, you get fluid buildup in your lungs that backs up into your mouth, and that's where that froth comes from. Drowning is also another reason that you can get froth in your mouth. Heart failure is another reason why you can get froth in your mouth. So it's not exclusive to drug overdoses. But actually, the most common thing we see at autopsy from a drug overdose is Nothing. But the absence of other findings is also important because it helps you support the diagnosis of an overdose. So those are the two. We, we see needle puncture marks a lot, but sometimes they're hard to see. All right, any questions about that before I go on? You guys are being awfully quiet. All right, so that's kind of what you expect to see at autopsy. Nothing or frothy fluid in the nose and mouth. Drug levels can change in the body after death, true or false? True. I've already talked to you guys just briefly about that because it's called post-mortem redistribution. That's why it's important when you're having an expert look at your toxicology, you need a forensic toxicologist. Dead people blood is not the same thing as living people blood. Medical toxicologists are great at medical toxicology, but you want someone who has experience in interpreting post-mortem toxicology. Okay, so another question. This gets everybody. I love this question. This gets, this gets cops, this gets the U.S. attorneys, everybody. What is the best sample to draw for postmortem toxicology? From any site where you can get blood, from the iliofemoral area, which is the groin, from the heart, from the armpit vessels, which is the axillary vessels, or urine. We're all over the map on this one. Good. This gets everybody. Most people answer the heart. C. Wrong. The best place to get blood from in postmortem samples is the groin, which is the ilo iliofemoral area. And the reason being, that is the area that minimizes the effect of postmortem redistribution. I can't tell you how many times I've seen reports where people go in and they stick a needle in the heart and pull it out and send it for toxicology and call it a drug overdose. Guess what sits right beneath your heart in your body? Your stomach. How many times do you think I've seen people actually stick the stomach and get gastric contents instead of blood and send it for toxicology? A lot more than you would be comfortable with, right? Famous case in Tennessee, an investigated agency who will remain a name did that. Um, on a vehicular homicide case where they drew their own toxicology and they accidentally drew stomach contents instead. And then you've got, guess what? It's a, it's a uh, defense attorney's dream because you've got two different sets of toxicology with two different, wildly different answers, right? So um, the best area to draw blood from is the femoral area because of the effect of what's called postmortem redistribution that I will tell you about if, I'm, if I will push the right clicker. Maybe, the iliofemoral area. So we've talked about the scene investigation. We've talked about medical history. We'll talk more about tolerance in just a minute and toxicology. Because of postmortem redistribution. So if you draw blood from the heart, so let's, let's just say, for example, someone takes a handful of pills. Let's say they take a handful of oxycodone and it's sitting in their stomach. When you're alive, 
Stuff that's in your stomach stays in your stomach or it moves down the food tube, moves down into the colon, right? If you're dead, guess what happens to some things, the chemicals that are in the stomach? They can diffuse out into other parts of the body. And because the heart sits right beside the stomach, guess where some of the drugs can go? Into the heart. So then what's going to happen when you draw blood from the heart? You'll have an artifactually high level of drug in the heart. But it's not just the heart. The liver sits right over here. The liver can do the same thing. And it's not just one direction. It can go from the liver to the stomach. It can go from the stomach to the liver. It can go from the liver to the heart. It can go from the heart to the liver. Doesn't always go in one direction. So that's why if you get it from out here in the femoral area, you minimize. You can never make postmortem redistribution zero, but you can minimize it, right? You can minimize it by drawing it from the femoral area. Sometimes you can't get it from there. When people start to decompose, it can be hard to get from the femoral area, but at least you need to try. So postmortem redistribution is the long term that means that drug concentrations can change in the body after death. I've already told you that it can move in different directions. And blood drawn from different areas of the body will have different levels. Now, this doesn't mean that those blood numbers are not reliable or that we can't use them. It just simply means that the person interpreting the postmortem toxicology needs to know that this can occur and needs to understand you have to take it into consideration. But we are drawing what's called vitreous fluid, which is the fluid from the eye. We draw this especially for heroin testing because what happens when you take heroin into your body? It metabolizes very quickly. So when you get a toxicology report back, it won't say heroin. It'll say morphine and monoacetylmorphine or 6-MAM, right? And so because it, your body breaks it down very quickly. And so to confirm that someone has used heroin, you can use fluid from the eye. You can also use urine. So that 6-MAM or that 6-monoacetylmorphine is a marker for heroin use because your toxicology report won't say heroin. It'll say morphine and 6-MAM. But you can also look for it here as well. Okay. This is how you read a toxicology report. No matter where the toxicology comes from, here, here's the things you need to look at. The compound, this is the listing of what was positive. Now, there's probably also a listing of what's negative as well. But they'll list what's positive, they'll list the result, and here's one of the most important things you need to look at. What was tested? Was it femoral blood? Was it hard blood? Was it vitreous fluid? Was it urine? What was it? Those are the components of the toxicology report that you need to be looking at. There will also be a reporting threshold or reporting limit that will also tell you how high it has to be before it can be reported as positive. So that's just kind of how you decode or the important parts of a toxicology report. Again, the other thing you would look at would be where is the sample from, what are they testing for, and if it's positive or negative. So all labs will still have that similar, uh, similar type of report format. Is there a question back here? Nope. Okay. So again, in the earlier presentation, there was a discussion about chemist and what certifications they should have in postmortem toxicology. So a postmortem toxicologist should have the qualifications from the American Board of Forensic Toxicology, ABFT. They don't have to be a fellow, which is the F stands for, or a diplomat. doesn't matter what that is, but the, the certifying body for forensic toxicology is ABFT. If you are dealing with a forensic toxicologist who is not ABFT certified, ask them why. Alternatively, there's also the American Board of Clinical Chemistry that is also an acceptable certification as long as they have the toxicologic chemistry certification afterwards. So there's a uh, toxicologist, a forensic toxicologist in the part of the country where I'm operating that has no certification by the American Board of Forensic Toxicology, no certification from the American Board of Clinical Chemistry. They did a um, basically a month-long course to get a different type of certification, but a month-long course does not qualify you for interpretation as an expert in forensic toxicology. You want to look for someone who 
has American Board of Forensic Toxicology or ABCC after their name. There is uh, drugs there at the scene, a white powdery substance. There is a loaded syringe that's there that showed evidence of use. And here's what her toxicology study shows. Now, her aut we did an autopsy. The autopsy was negative. She had fentanyl in her femoral blood, and norfentanyl is just the metabolite or what your body turns fentanyl into. So what's her cause of death? Somebody tell me. We know what the cause of death, we know the definition of cause of death. Here's her toxicology. What's her cause of death? You tell me. Somebody said accident. Is accident a cause of death? Accident is a manner of death. What is her cause of death? You have to fill out her death certificate. It's pressure. It's pressure. Well, what's her cause of death? Acute fentanyl overdose. It's not rocket science. Her autopsy is negative. We know what she has at the scene. She has a history of drug use. The cause of death. This is an easy one. We don't get these very often because there's only one drug there. Acute fentanyl overdose is her cause of death. Let's try another one. You guys didn't do so good on that one. Let's try again. Gentleman found dead at home. He's lying here. He's obviously ill-appearing. He's known to be a chronic drug user. He's got his kit there. We call it the Tennessee trifecta, his syringe and his spoon and his cotton. He's got a track mark on his front of his elbow. Looks like a drug overdose. We do an autopsy. Autopsy's negative. Syringe in his pocket. Here's his toxicology. He's got methamphetamine. We haven't talked about methamphetamine. What's his cause of death? Thank you for playing along. It's not rocket science, right? What's his cause of death? Acute methamphetamine toxicity. What is the fate? Is there a fatal level of methamphetamine? No, there is not. Methamphetamine is not an opiate. It is a stimulant. Methamphetamine and cocaine are different. There are not, quote, lethal levels of either one. You can die technically from any amount of methamphetamine. So you can start to see now, if you have a mixed drug intoxication that involves methamphetamine and cocaine, causation can start to be a little bit more difficult. But this one's easy. One drug, acute methamphetamine intoxication. Now let's get into a harder one. 33-year-old man found dead at home, cut straws on scene, brown powdery substance. Autopsy's negative. Here's his toxicology. Rut row. What are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? Multiple yes, multiple and put something in parentheses after that. But what are you going to put? He's got cocaine. Okay, so you said whichever one is lethal. Is there a lethal level of cocaine? No, any amount of cocaine could potentially be lethal. So it's going to be acute combined drug overdose, cocaine, fentanyl. What's acetyl fentanyl? You guys know what that is? It's one of those fentanyl analogs that we've been talking about that's even stronger than regular fentanyl. So his cause of death on his death certificate is going to read acute combined drug overdose, cocaine, fentanyl, and acetyl fentanyl. Somebody's going to prosecute that case. What's the but-for cause of death? <laughs> Somebody said marijuana. Marijuana doesn't kill anybody. Everybody smokes marijuana. Marijuana kills nobody, right? What's the, what's the but-for cause of death? I don't know. Any one of those three things could be the but-for legal cause of death. Now you can start to see how causation can be a little bit more difficult. If I were answering this on the stand, I would say either the cocaine independently or the fentanyl independently or the acetyl fentanyl independently could cause death, and I'm going to let you guys work out the rest. If you've got somebody that's coming in and saying, ah, oh, the cocaine's not that high, that didn't do it. Ah, oh, the acetyl fentanyl isn't that high, that didn't do it. You need to view that with suspicion, and I'd say get a second opinion. Because it could be any one of those three things that might cause death. Okay, moving on. Very quickly. Another case. 28-year-old woman found dead at home, just like you see her. If anybody is observant, you will see that her left arm looks more decomposed than her right. Anybody know why that is? It's an effect of the way she's laying. The blood is pooling more toward the left, so she's going to have a little bit more lividity on that side. She's also got another early postmortem change there. 
marbling is what that's called, but she is an IV drug user. Here's her, we didn't do an autopsy on this one. Here's her toxicology, here's her methadone. We haven't talked about methadone either. You guys know what methadone is, right? Methadone is a uh, medication-assisted therapy that they use for people that are uh, struggling with opioid use disorder. What is a fatal level of methadone? It depends. It depends. So when I talked about needing to get her, her uh, level of tolerance and her medical history, that's what we need to get because I can't interpret this just based on the numbers alone. All right, what if I told you, pushing the wrong damn button again, what if I told you that the, quote, lethal range, there is no such thing technically as a lethal range because it depends on the circumstances, it is between 200 and 1,400 of methadone. She's in that lethal range, so she died of a methadone overdose, right? Wrong. People that are on chronic methadone therapy can have numbers higher than her and be perfectly fine. So is methadone overdose the cause of death? Yes, no, maybe don't have enough information. You probably know by now the answer is maybe don't have enough information. What if I tell you that she's been on methadone for 10 years? Now in that context, that methadone level is not that high. I did a guy that was walking down the street that got hit by a car with that level of methadone. That's nothing, right? Now what if I told you that we did an autopsy and she's got these. These are lungs. Anybody here with a, an emergency medical background or any kind of medical background? She's got this big giant thing here in her lung that's a blood clot. This is why you need to do an autopsy on someone that's suspected to be a drug overdose because you can't exclude without an autopsy things like this. This is called a pulmonary embolism you drop dead immediately from a pulmonary embolism. This is where history comes in. What was she doing prior to dropping dead? Right? What does her family say she was doing? They said she was standing up talking, cooking dinner, and then dropped dead. Is that consistent with a drug overdose? Not really. It's more consistent with a pulmonary embolism. But this is why they recommend that you do autopsies, right? Now lastly, because I'm running out of time, here's a question that comes up very often in court cases. Several people are using drugs from the same batch at the same time, but only one person dies. Why is that? Juries always, they have a hard time understanding this. Tolerance is one, that's, that's a real good example. Tolerance is one, but let's look at a case that, it, that examines that. 37-year-old man with his girlfriend and another passenger in a car, they were parked at a hotel. Passenger or a passerby called EMS, everybody in the car was unresponsive. The driver has a, the dead guy has a history of intravenous drug use. So he dies. He's got drug paraphernalia on him. Two other people were resuscitated and lived. Why did he die and the other people live? Tolerance is the first question because tolerance means you have to use this more of the drug to get the same effect over time. Here's is what a toxicology looks like. He's got morphine. Fentanyl and butyrfentanyl. What's his cause of death? What did I tell you about morphine when you see morphine? You want to be suspicious about heroin, right? But he's also got fentanyl and butyrfentanyl. So he's an acute combined drug overdose. Butyrfentanyl is another one of those fentanyl analogs, okay? We look in his urine, and guess what he's got? He's got that 6 ma'am that confirms that morphine was from heroin. So he's an acute combined drug overdose. They were all using from the same batch. Why is he dead? Well, he might have been tolerant, but another reason is what we call the chocolate chip cookie theory. So when people are mixing these drugs up, are they doing it in a very quality controlled way where it's evenly distributed throughout the baggie? Absolutely not. Just like when you make cookies, some cookies have more chips and more people, more, some cookies have less chips. Well, when you're mixing up drugs in a baggie, some's going to have more fentanyl and some's going to have more butyrfentanyl, right? So this is one way that it can be explained to juries why some people die and some people don't if they're using from the same batch of drugs, the chocolate chip cookie theory. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip through this because I'm running short on time, but I want to get to one last thing. Um, when is someone at highest risk of overdose? A, after prolonged incarceration, B, after prolonged hospitalization, or C, after release from rehab, or D, all of the above? The answer is D, all of the above, because what happens when you're in, the, in, the, uh, in prison for a long time? 
or in the hospital for a long time, or you've been in rehab for a while, what happens? You lose your tolerance, and then you come back out and you start using the same amount you were using before you went in, and then you die from an overdose. So keep that in mind. Okay. I love this. Five people were arrested in a math lab bust in Kentucky. <laughs> uh, if you're from a, a southern state, you understand that we all argue about who is the worst southern state. And so anybody know what, anybody know what the state motto of Alabama is? Thank God for Mississippi. <laughs> all right. Uh, very quickly, I've already talked about the difference between coroners. Do you guys know what the, what the qualifications for coroners are here in Pennsylvania? I didn't say that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, hearing a, I'm hearing a lot of kerfuffle going on in the audience. Uh, but basically, you have to live in the county. You've got to be 18, and then you have to have about 32 hours of instruction before you can do it. I don't know about you, but I, this is better than some states. So, for example, to become a forensic pathologist, I got a bachelor's degree in chemistry. I got a medical degree. I did five years of pathology training in anatomic and clinical pathology, and then I did another additional entire year of forensic training in forensic pathology. Compare that to 32 hours of instruction. I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just saying, know your expert, all right? So that being said, um, there are best practice recommendations for forensic toxicology and what they should be testifying to and what they shouldn't be testifying, what they should and shouldn't be saying in court. Those are available online. It should be in your packet. So a toxicologist should not be opining about the cause of death. If you have a toxicologist saying the cause of death is heroin overdose, you really need to challenge them on it because that's not the role of a toxicologist. Toxicologists are great partners in what we do, but it's the purview of the medical examiner or the coroner to determine cause of death, not the toxicologist. For those of you that have been asleep, wake up. Here's what you need to know. Components of a death investigation should be a scene, history, autopsy, and toxicology. Life is short. Do what you love. So one thing that I, I want to share with you that I, I said early on is that we, in practice, we don't autopsy every single person that we think might be a drug overdose. We have a lot of cases that come in as natural versus overdose. And so the reason or the way we make our decision about who we're, we're going to autopsy or not um, is basically twofold, is we have our on-scene death investigator. So even if somebody doesn't get an autopsy, we have the ability to still go out and do a thorough death scene and do all the things that I showed you here in the, in, in, uh, you know, for the past hour and a half that I showed you what a scene investigation should look like. So we have that, and I also review the medical history. So given my background and training, I feel like that I can make a professional judgment about who I need to autopsy and who I don't. So in a perfect world, would everybody be autopsied? Yes. But most jurisdictions will tell you that they don't have the resources nor the funding to meet that mandate. And that's what a lot, that's what a lot of the complaint is about that um, standard that everybody that's probably an overdose gets an autopsy is an unfunded mandate. You know, we don't, we're not funded to, to do that and we're not funded to have the personnel to do that. So that's one of the arguments and that's one of the pushbacks that you will probably get if you try to challenge people on why they didn't do an autopsy. But it's a lot easier to challenge the cause of death without an autopsy if there wasn't a scene investigation and there wasn't a review of medical history and things of that nature. So I, I just wanted to kind of formalize that point. So the question is, can a forensic pathologist tell if somebody died, died of an overdose by just looking at the, at the toxicology report? No. That is not, uh, would not be standard of practice. You have to take the, uh, the toxicology findings in context with what you know about the person, what the scene investigation is, what their medical history is, and what other type of body examination there is. Because, for example, I, I kind of skipped it because I ran out of time, but if you look at what the if you look at the numbers that you can look up on the internet about what the fatal level of morphine is, the fatal level of morphine ranges from 20 to 200. That's a pretty damn big range, right? And so it depends. The answer is it depends. Whether or not that's a fatal level depends on all those other things. So if you've got someone, whether it be a forensic pathologist or a toxicologist, just looking at the numbers on the toxicology report and giving you a cause of death, that's problematic. Uh, yeah, before you do that, there was one other question over here on this side. Right, so the question is about HIPAA. 
Um, and so it depends on if you're talking about living people or dead people. So I'm going to talk about dead people because that's what I do. There are specific carve-outs in the federal HIPAA law for coroners and medical examiners that are undergoing death investigation. So if you have a dead person and someone is refusing to give you that, that their, their cause of death is under investigation and someone's quoting HIPAA, you can call BS, right, and tell them, no, this case is actively under investigation um, and we have the right to get those records. Now, in most states, even the autopsy report and the toxicology are public record. In Tennessee, an autopsy report, the toxicology report, and the report of investigation by the county medical examiner are public records. Um, so while technically HIPAA does apply to people who are deceased, if their death is under investigation by a medical examiner or coroner, then HIPAA does not apply to that. How do private autopsies play into all of this? I know that sometimes families, for instance, aren't happy that an they don't conduct an autopsy and things like that, and they go to get a private autopsy done. Are they able to, I mean, do they generate a report? Can they affect uh, the ruling on the death certificate? Things like that. Yeah, so that's a great question about private autopsy. So the, the autopsies are ordered under different types of circumstances. So in almost every state, medical examiner um, autopsies and investigations are done under specific state statute. Private autopsies are different. So if a case does not fall under medical examiner jurisdiction and the family wants an autopsy, yes, they can do that, but the family has to give permission to do that. They have to give the legal permission by the next of kin in order to do that. That does fall under a medical record. So that is protected by HIPAA because it's considered a medical record if it is a private autopsy. But... Um, um, you know, if the family wants to get a second opinion, if the medical examiner does an autopsy and they don't agree with the findings, yes, they can get a second autopsy that would fall under the private private autopsy. So it depends. It depends on um, under what authority the autopsy is being ordered. Families do challenge cause of death, and they challenge cause of death a lot. Um, suicide is the manner of death that we get the most challenges on from families. Uh, we've actually had a change in the state law in Tennessee about how, what we do as far as ruling suicide as the manner of death. I have to be very careful with families about changing the manner or cause of death because I don't want to change. The reason for me changing the cause or manner of death can't be because the family can get different benefits from the life insurance. That's called fraud on my part. If I change the death certificate so the family can get double indemnity for their life insurance, yeah, that's fraud and I'm not going to do that. Um, and so it's a fine balance between meeting the needs of the family and helping them and maintaining our objectivity and personal and, and professional independence. To what extent did the, uh, is the defense hampered when the defense's expert didn't actually get a chance to see the body and is just reading reports and looking at slides? Great question. The question is, so I'm just kind of giving a second opinion and I haven't seen the body. The way I answer that is uh, while it's true that the medical examiner that actually did the examination had the best shot at looking at the body, but I have to rely on the fact that their interpretation is accurate and correct. Um, and so I would turn that around and I'd say, are you telling me I can't rely on the observations of that pathologist? You know, do I have reason to believe that's not true? Um, so that is, a, that is a very good line of questioning, and you just have to handle it on a case-by-case -case basis. But that's another reason for your expert needs to request the entire medical examiner case file, which should include scene investigation, autopsy photographs, toxicology, any handwritten notes between the pathologist in the office. Um, also, if sections were taken to look at under the microscope, your pathologist wants to look at those too. Um, and so that helps mitigate you know, the effect of you weren't the person that saw the body. But that's where photographs come in. Now, it, pretty much it's standard in all forensic autopsies. There's going to be photographs taken. Great question. You mentioned because of lack of resources, you may not always do an autopsy. But if you suspect at the beginning it may be homicide, wouldn't you do an autopsy in all of those cases? Yes, absolutely. If, we, if there's a suspicion, so I should have clarified that, that we don't always do an autopsy on someone that we think is a drug overdose. If someone is a suspected homicide, yes, we will do an, we will do an autopsy on that person. So the absence of an autopsy is pretty good evidence for the defendant that you didn't think it, at least initially, didn't think it was a homicide. Yeah, but I wouldn't be ruling a drug overdose a homicide anyway. 
Right. Because homicide, from the legal perspective, for, you're talking about from a drug overdose, as a drug overdose? Yeah. Yeah. There was no autopsy. You'd have, somebody would have said, gee, this may be a homicide. I better get an autopsy. Yes, but we, but we know in our jurisdiction that drug overdoses are not called homicides. Unless there's evidence that somebody held someone down and injected them with drugs against their will, which in 20 years of practice, I've never seen that, <laughs> never seen that happen. Um, so, yeah, we, we don't call drug overdoses homicides. Yeah. But, but if, if you have someone like in, in that coroner's office that was on the screen that they did, that would actually be a really good point. Is, you know, Coroner Jones, you're telling me this was a homicide, but yet you didn't feel it important to do an autopsy on this person? That, that's a really good point. 